Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Mistai Podcast. I am your host, Chris, and today I am joined with one of my favorite YouTubers and academics, uh, Dr. Justin Sledge of Esoterica. I've been watching Esoterica for a good few years, and he's really helped me, uh, especially go on the more academic side of my occult study. Uh, and it's been absolutely incredible. Some of the work uh, Justin puts out is really, really great. I recommend his resources to everybody. Um, and I'm just really, really pleased to have Justin with us today. Yeah. Justin, hey. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for... Uh... For having me on and you know for the nice things you uh, you say about esoterica yeah i really appreciate uh folks checking it out and i'm glad that it's a, a resource mm. yeah absolutely i mean it's the biggest thing um I mean, we were just talking about this uh before we started uh, officially recording um but one of the biggest things uh that i think really attracts me and probably a lot of your wider audience for esoterica is that you're taking a much more academic perspective to the study of occultism rather than sort of the typical like woo woo regular like sort of conscious community stuff or approach to things you take much more of an academic approach to it uh and it's that it's really refreshing to uh to come back from an academic perspective because you just don't see that because people have this perception of magic right or esotericism that it is kind of a because, it, because it's not a real quote-unquote subject it's not a real thing uh that there is no real sources there is no reason for acad academia or scholars to actually be interested in this kind of thing but that isn't really true at all <laughs> Right. No, not at all. Right. It's a uh, it's a case that Western esotericism is, is also a relatively new branch of academic study. You know, the first chairs like uh, Professor Hanegraaff has in Amsterdam or Anton Pfeiffer had in, in Paris. You know, they're less than 30 years old. Yeah. So we're talking about a, an academic discipline that's that's really, really in its infancy. And it's not <clears throat> still not terribly respected in the academy. That's changing, but it's still on the fringes of the academy in some ways. Um, and you know, the, the literature on esotericism, um, uh, is really mixed. I mean, there's really great stuff out there. Um, and there's some stuff that's just, you wonder where they got this stuff from. Yeah. Uh, and then there's just fringe conspiracy theory, like Nazis, which, you know, yeah. um, it's amazing that you don't have to scratch the surface very deeply. And you're like, you go from, I don't know, talking about something interesting like John D and all of a sudden three, you know, three, three, uh, three minutes in it's Atlantis and the Aryans and yeah. thrill or something. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. We're, we're in Nazi land now. So yeah, it's, it's really a mess. And that's part of the reason why I started Esoterica was just looking at what was available online, looking at YouTube, for instance, I was consuming a lot of academic YouTube. I was watching Jackson Crawford and other folks who, you know, were academic YouTubers and when I just went into YouTube, which we should never forget is the, basically it's the second largest search engine in the world. Mm. You type in some things. I started typing in some things that I, I have some academic background in and I just was shocked about how, how poor the quality was. Yeah. Um, and so I think the channel's successful because it's serving a need and yeah. it's really great that skeptics, people who have no interest, uh, you know, in magic or esotericism can come and consume the content from a purely historical point of view. Uh, as a terrorist, you know, people who, who practiced uh, the occult or Enochian magic or what, what have you for many years also seem to tell me that they find the, the channel resourceful. So that's fantastic. My thing, my favorite people are people writing books or building uh, RPGs, people oh, yeah. doing RPGs and writing books. Um, I've, I've gotten, I've seen my name in the back of, you know, thanks to Esoterica for uh, helping me, you know, pioneer this game mechanic. Uh, um, based on the Ars Notoria or whatever. So it's, it's fun also just to be a, again, just to be a resource and that, uh, and it's nice that folks find it uh, reliable and worthwhile. So I really am, I feel blessed in that regard. Mm. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I think like, like you said, that it feels, it feels a very real need, right? I think, uh, one of the big things, especially when you're, especially if you're coming at it from, I guess you would say like a more practical point of view is in terms of you're a practicing occultist. A lot of the time, if you're if you're going into things like the ceremonial tradition or the Solomonic tradition with the Grimwilds and things throughout the medieval and Renaissance period and all of that kind of stuff, a lot of it is such a broken tradition that it, it's almost impossible to know where to start with it, especially reconstructing anything that's actually remotely practical things. You know, and I think a lot of people, their default will be to almost come at this from a historical point of view. And that's a large part of the reason why I think, you know, people don't consider magic a very 
quote unquote science to it. But in the medieval and the Renaissance worldview, it really was kind of a science, especially if you take the definition of a science as a procedure or sort of a methodology where you know you are creating theories, hypotheses, anything like that, and you're testing them and you were waiting on the results to alter whatever your original theory was. In that sense, magic is completely a science, right? Yeah, because you're I mean, working through things and you're waiting for a response and then altering what was going on. Um, in fact, in fact, in in many of the grimoires, the, the the word for spell in Latin is experimenta, and so yeah. and so we see this term you know, an experiment for invisibility, and you know, uh, of course, experiment. The name of that has changed, but yeah, it has the idea of testability. And what's really fascinating in some of these manuscripts are the marginalia, where the where the magicians are not only doing these experimenta, but they're altering them in the practice, which is showing that they're tinkering. Uh, this is sort of a magical tinkering. So, um, so yeah, it, it is, it is much more systematic, uh, than people probably think it is. And that's true of alchemy and other things as well. Yeah. But, you know, I think the the big difference now, and this is a thing that's always kind of struck me as unusual or perplexing, I suppose, is that, you know, the worldview that made magic possible in the middle ages, most modern contemporary people don't have that worldview. Mm. Um, for instance, it's a basic trope that you're a Catholic. Like, yeah. That's just, that's just, there's because there's nothing else. I mean, in 1250 or 1450, I mean, either you're a Catholic or you were a Jew, and that's basically who you who you could be in Europe. Um, and so the the basic default assumption is you're a pious Catholic. And you know, often I talk to my occult practitioner people, and I'm like, yeah, Agrippa, the three books of occult philosophy doesn't make any sense really outside of a Catholic geocentric worldview. Mm. It relies on those philosophically and theologically. And so, yeah, it is a case that. That I wouldn't say that the tradition is broken, but I, what I would say is that it is it, it, it to, to contemporize it, which is one of the things that Crowley did, I think, really well with kind of mm-hmm. psychologizing magic. He didn't, you know, to the degree to which he did, I think he backtracked on that later in his life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's a fascinating project to try to see the ingenious moves, and they really are ingenious to try mm-hmm. to to reinvigorate these traditions and make them. And make them work, whether it's the Ars Notoria or the Grimoire tradition or um, or the Enochian system or systems as much as there is a system in there. I think there are probably four or five. Yeah. Um, uh, most of them, some of them not really complete. It's kind of a mess. So, yeah, that to me, that's the really fascinating thing. That's why I love being in conversation with practitioners, even though I'm not a practitioner, mm. um, because I'm just in awe of their spiritual athletics to be able to take these otherwise very odd texts and bring them to life in a, in a contemporary way. It's, but to me, that's very, uh, you know, it's kind of a spiritual heroism in that. So, mm. um, yeah, I think it is like, there is a, yeah, there, there, I think it is an art form to mm-hmm. it. And this is the thing where we like well, as much as magic and all esotericism as a whole is, is a, it, it is a systematic system. Right. But I think, especially when you're coming to, I mean, I suppose this is a conversation around the, the idea of translation as well but engaging with esoteric uh, texts especially manuscripts and things like that reading them is one thing but then actually interpreting them and using them or anything like that is completely just a different school of thought it's an entirely different system that you're going to be using and it is absolutely an art form to be able to take whatever is on that page or whatever is in the, in the manuscript and actually make something out of it i think mm-hmm. but it's in the same way and this is one of the challenges that i think well, one of the challenges that one of the, one of the bigger challenges, I should say, uh, that makes a lot of the grimoire tradition very inaccessible to people. And that obviously, like you were saying, because you, you have a lot of sort of the standard assumptions of the day when the way people are going to, well, how they identify themselves as being Catholic or Jew or anything like that, you also have to think the context in which these things are written, the majority of the language is going to be Latin and Greek or anything like that. Or maybe if you're looking at, say, any of the Hermetic texts, probably Arabic is, is the big one. That's where a lot of them are preserved, right? Uh, and the vast majority of even occult practitioners don't obviously speak those languages. You might you might find the occasional occult practitioner who may have learned Latin or anything like that, especially if they're working with the the, the Key of Solomon manuscripts or anything like that. Um, but having those languages are or in, in like in having an understanding of those languages in your arsenal it is one thing. But then again, translating those languages across into English, into actual ways, it is just an entirely different thing, right? Because not only do you have to understand the wording, but you also have to understand the concepts, I think, in both languages well enough to choose the right word to translate over, uh, which is just, it, it's such an incredibly difficult 
situation to be in uh, because you don't we don't really have anyone who is is sort of very fiercely or, or very sort of qualified as an academic while also a seasoned occult practitioner who can actually knows all the languages and knows the practice to be able to combine the two. Uh, it's, it's rare. Yeah, it's certainly more rare now to find someone who's who's competent in both. Mm. Um, although I'll say with, you know, it's also the cultural context. I, I tell people, if you want to understand medieval grimoires and if grimoire, medieval grimoires strike people as odd, then the, the complementary things to be reading are exorcism manuals. Because exorcism manuals, yeah. uh, medieval exorcism manuals, which which the church continues to use, the Ritual Romanum has been mm. continuously updated uh, yeah, all yeah. the way up to the 1970s. Um, they're based; they're all based in exorcistic manuals. And so, mm. when you when you look at the manuals and you understand what it is an exorcist does in the Middle Ages, which you know, you know, you could do you could perform exorcisms as a very minor in a very minor order. Mm. Um, in fact, one could do exorcisms even if one weren't licensed to do the mass. So it's it's weird to think about, you know, because technically exorcisms aren't are miraculous in the same way the mass is. Um, but that's the place to go look if you really want to get inside of the mind of a medieval necromancer. Um, you need to put yourself in the mind of a priest in relatively low orders, probably not terribly educated, um, but knows some Latin, has their knows their way around the Catholic Church and the rituals of the Catholic Church. Because all of the medieval manuals, most of them, most of the major ones, are basically alterations of medieval um, exorcistic rituals, practically, in in order to get you know demons to do things for you. Yeah. So, so that's a place I think people you know, and it's an episode I want to do actually is on these exorcism manuals because I think most people have never, most people's experience of like a, an exorcism is. Uh, you know, the power of Christ compels you. This yeah, thing like from the exorcist kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which that stuff is in there. Uh, there's the, that, the, you know, the, the exorcism in the exorcist is actually very, it's to the money. It's actually based on the Roman ritual. Yeah. Uh, the only difference is that, you know, they, it took them 45 minutes when in fact exorcisms in the actual world can go on for months and years. Yeah. Um, but that's a place, that's a place. Um, but I will say that, you know, the Latin, the Latin of most of the grimoires and most of the, ceremonial text it's not great latin it's not very yeah it's, it's, yeah it's it's not you're not you're not reading cicero and so it's yeah. not that it's not that difficult um you know it's pretty garish latin at the end of the day and so i would say that even with some basic a year's worth of latin college level latin under your belt you could easily work your way around uh, most of the medieval grimoires um and also, I think that many practitioners are sort of frozen in the early 20th century where Mathers and A.E. Waite and those guys are translating of that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I think what is the key of Solomon? That was all three manuscript I think he used were from the Bibliothèque Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know we now know that there are at least 150 manuscripts of the key of Solomon tradition in, in public hands. That's not counting all the ones in private hands. Yeah. There are they're, they're many in private hands. And so. And there's no critical edition, by the way. There's none. Mm. It just doesn't exist. There is no critical edition of this literature. There won't be. There's not even one on the horizon. And so I think many uh, many practitioners just don't know that the textual tradition is actually much, much richer than, you know, Mather's Key of Solomon text. Yeah. And the, or, that, or that, for instance, the Goetia, that's really popular because I think of the Lema. Uh, the Goetia was a very minor magical tradition. You know, it's. In fact, it has its origins in kind of a joke. Uh, the Johann Weyer's uh, Pseudo Monarchia Demonorum was meant to be a, a, a basically a joke, making fun of demons and people. Who yeah, it's, it's the what is it like the pseudo like the actual translation yeah. is like the the pseudo monarchy or the pseudo, yeah, the pseudo monarchy of demons. Of demons it's, yeah, yeah, it's completely it was meant to be, and it's just ironic that this has now become you like know, an, actual going, thing. Yeah. an actual thing. It's you know the same with the Necronomicon and Lovecraft, and now the Simon Necronomicon. So you yeah. know it's. Um, First is tragedy, then is farce. It's it's sort of hilarious that the Goetia uh, began as a kind of joke, um, and now it's blossomed into like a almost fully, every like workable system, fully workable system yeah. that you know that I think is probably the most popular. It's you know certainly going to Reddit and everyone's you know yeah, it's, it's Sigil ev- this and everyone, Sigil that. Yeah, everyone does it. it. It's 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 fascinating to me because like especially if you look at I mean well so I mean if you read any of sort of like uh, Stephen Skinner's work and things like that. He's done a really, really great job of tracing the methodology, at least, of the Grimoire, of the Grimoire tradition back to the Greek magical papyri, right? So the PGM. Um, 
back through sort of the Solomonic grimoires to, uh, I think it's the Hygromantia in, in uh, was it Constantinople? And then from the Hygromantia back to the PGM. Uh, and he, he shows it very, very clearly that the, by, while the, the, the names and the context and things will change depending on the culture, usually and when it got to Europe, obviously it's Judeo-Christian. So a lot of the divine names and things used to compel the spirits are Judeo-Christian in nature. Uh, but you go back to the PGM and it's the same methodology all the time. Just the the names are obviously in the a, a, quite unquote a pagan context where you're using Greek gods or Egyptian gods and that kind of thing, um, and even the the Solomonic methodology of, of like summoning an actual spirit follows Egyptian convention a lot of the time, like Egyptian priestly convention. Obviously, it's gone through many many years of different change and everything like that. But um, it's yeah, and it, it it is kind of fascinating to me how how much people go immediately to the Galatia. And it's it's interesting as well because the, the version of the Goetia that people use is, is nine times out of ten, like you said, it's going to be the Mathers version, or I guess a better connect would be it would be the Crowley version that Crowley kind of stole from Mathers and Publisher himself, right? And it's that kind of like the even even the the magic circle that they use, right? The Goetic circle with the the snake and the Hebrew around it and all that kind of thing, which is like Crowley's version. That manuscript that they're using is a really really late manuscript i think it's like 17th century 18th century something like that all, all, all of all the all the less acute following literatures they all that literature dates from the 17th century mm. um, okay it's yeah. Very, yeah it's it's that that entire magical system i suppose is it's it's, it's it's actually uniquely anglophone it only exists in mm. england um and it's yeah it's relatively late now i don't know that something being early or late makes it more or less authentic yeah um but um yeah, it is. It's just again. I think it has everything to do with the fact that you know Crowley was great at uh, great at many things, and one of those was uh, self promotion. And I think that's part of the reason why it stuck. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think most, even most occult practitioners don't know of all the other um, pile, piles and piles of necromantic manuals uh, yeah. or or key, the Key of Solomon literature. How vast it is. Ars Notoria tradition, which is. And that's even older, isn't it? Like the art, because the Arsenatoria is a is a weird one because it's it's included. I think Crowley and Mathers even included in in their edition of the Lamentaton. But originally, yeah. I don't think it was. Was it because the Arsenatoria tradition is much much older? Because it's like medieval scholarly magic, isn't it? So yeah, it's, it, it predates probably dates, it. probably dates back to the late twelfth or thirteenth centuries, somewhere in the I think in the milieu of uh, the University of Paris. Um, yeah. um, I think that's where it develops. And yeah, and, and it's funny because you know the. It's included in the the Lesser Key of Solomon. Um, it's included in there, but it's uh, the version translated by Robert Turner that's actually found in the Agrippa uh, opera, published around 1600. Hmm. But what's funny about that Agrippa opera version, which is that whole version is funny just because um, if you look at the two-volume Agrippa opera, um, which I actually have, <laughs> and um, you you... It's just the the two volumes weren't quite the same size, so in order to make mm. the volume kind of match, they just piled in a bunch of occult literature that has nothing to do with Agrippa, um, like the Arbitel and all this. There's all kinds of stuff just crammed in there. Mm. Um, and what's funny is that they also crammed the Ars Notoria in there, and that's the version that and ultimately Robert Turner will translate, and that's the one that most people pub- probably encountered. But the, it, what's hilarious or ironic about that one, of course, is that none of the noti are there. The whole purpose yeah, of the so book kind is of to defeats. inspect these noti. Yeah, and it tells you in the Turner version. Yeah, you have to go look at the notai. None of the notai are there, so it's a very peculiar. It's just one of these books that that it's you know Voltaire said of the Bible that it's more celebrated than known, and mm. that I, I feel the same way sometimes about the Lesser Key of Solomon. I'm like, how many people are actually reading this thing? Because it's kind of a mess. Yeah. Um, that, but I think most people are, aren't reading the whole thing. Most people are not looking at the Ars Paulina or the. Yeah. All model they're going straight to the Goetia and Paimon and you know or or what have you, um, but again it's just um, it's, a, it's a peculiar little peculiar little volume, mm. and again famous I think mostly because of because of Crowley and the rise of Thelema, but uh, the amount of Western magic it's just enormous. And to go back to the Ars Notoria, and there is not yet still a complete translation of the Ars Notoria. You you could not. Unless you read Latin, and and the Latin there actually is really challenging, mm. but unless you uh, read Latin, you could not practice the Ars Notoria as a form of of magic. I think that's changing. I think there is an edition coming out, 
Mm. But, um, I know, I know, Steve. Uh, I, I know Stephen Skinner recently released, like last year, he released because he, he's done two. He's got he, he's published one, which is like the Ars Autoria A, I think that he said, uh, which which contains all the notai uh, from like one man, one particular manuscript. I, I, I seem to remember it might be from like the Sloan collection or something like that, or the Welcome collection, something like that. They have a version of it that has the notai, and he recently released one of them, uh, another version of the book last year, which is like the methodology for it. But I right. can't remember which uh, which manuscript he's using as a translation for that. But I know that the version A, I have it over here. Version A has several different versions of the Notai, which is nice because uh, mm-hmm. they are different. They do change from manuscript yeah. to manuscript. They get more and more elaborate and there are more and more angels and things in them. Um, uh, the early manuscripts, the Notai are very simple by the end of the mm-hmm. tradition. They're very complicated. Yeah. Um, and they're not contiguous. They change a good bit along the way. Um, but yeah, the big thing is that there are. Uh, so the Ars Notoria tradition is the original text is relatively brief. Mm. And then there was a internal commentary written on it about a century later that explains how to do it all. And then there was another commentary written upon that. That's all integrated into one book. Yeah. And depending on the sections that you translate or don't translate, you don't get all, all three of, of those. Yeah. Um, but you can have the Verities has uh, as a, uh, the critical edition out and it's you know if you read french you can you can um uh, you can read his translation and um and the he reproduces uh critical edition of the, the latin manuscript tradition as well or he bases it on one of the better um yeah the, the more complete one of the volume. one of the more complete yeah the, i think it's one of the ones in the bibliotheque nationale that's the one of the yeah. more complete versions yeah yeah, right. yeah yeah well it's it's, it's I, the the, the Ozotoria is a fascinating one for me because i don't like I've, I've I've read a lot of grimoires in, in my time, right? I, I've seen a lot of stuff, uh, but I haven't really seen another practice like the notoria. As that be just that that idea of inspecting notai or the, the concept of notai in general. Like we have sigils all over the place in, in throughout the grimoire tradition. They're they're everywhere, but notai and sigils are not used in the same way. They're not at all the same thing, right? But I think I, I haven't found anywhere else that the note, like the concept of the notai, something that you kind of gaze at or engage with, I don't know, with your consciousness or however it is it's supposed to work. And then you use that to, either, well, yes, gain knowledge, but something that you're sort of passively engaging with at the same time. I just haven't seen that in any other tradition anywhere. No, it's peculiar. I mean, I think the closest thing maybe is something like mandalas. Um, yeah, that's something like that, where you, you know, in the, uh, in the Buddhist tradition where you gaze at them as a part of the meditation, um, a meditation, uh, process. Mm. Yeah. They're weird. It's, it's a peculiar literature. It's, you know, really shrouded in mystery, how it first developed, which is kind of fun. Yeah. It's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, in that way, it's just neat how it developed. And I, you know, for me as a, you know, I love the world of like 13th century, 13th century, yeah. the 11th and uh, 11th, 12th and 13th century. They're just I would say that in many ways, like the 12th century Renaissance is probably the most important period in, in European intellectual history. Mm. Um, the Italian Renaissance, of course, is important for art, but, you know, um, like like 12th century Renaissance is, yeah. you know, it's super important. And um, yeah, it's just a fascinating uh, a kind of knowledge, you know, kind of knowledge magic. And I think the only similar kind of magic would be the Sar Torah literature that is yeah. appended to some Merkava texts where you get this angel the sar torah the prince of the torah that comes down and and um that gives you all this rabbinical knowledge rapidly um mm-hmm. i don't think there's any connection genetically between the sar torah literature and the ars notoria they don't look at all alike yeah they're the only they're on they're the only two forms of magical knowledge acquisition knowledge gaining that, yeah yeah that i and they say rapid but i mean you know, the Ars Notoria still takes you four months. And it's yeah, still... it's it's a long it's a long operation, isn't it? Like right. it, it's not something that happens quickly. Uh, yeah, and then it's like you... it's it's like is it going to be? And like, this, this is what what's always fascinating for me, I guess, where it's like from like a phenomenological or like an experiential perspective, because like evidently they can't have just like like I don't know. This is just, I guess this is just my own personal opinion of the whole thing. But some like a system that complex, like something must have happened someone must have experienced something and in the very least to be able to write that kind of system so it's like what like is the whole system is the Tutorial like is it going to be an entire system where you're doing this thing at the end of the operation you like experience what is i guess basically like neo in the matrix that you just have like a download of like kung fu in your mind or something like that and it's like immediate learning or is it going to be more like you just you have an increase in your learning speed and then that's going to, you know, you just grasp concepts easier or whatever it is. Like, what's the actual practice 
of what that looks like in the actual experience of someone who's engaging the Isle Sartoria. That's what's mm-hmm. fascinating to me from like a phenomenological perspective. No, but, for sure. And we, we do know that, you know, it, it could go badly. John Morangi is the most famous example. He was practicing the Ars Notoria and didn't, he didn't properly do it and had all these horrifying visions. Um, yeah. And he, he literally, he, he made, he developed a, an alternative to the Ars Notoria because he was so mentally damaged by it that it's called mm-hmm. the Libra Visionum. Uh, that is much more Marian or um, uh, organized, uh, and that manuscript, that manuscript tradition also survives. Mm. So that's a, to go back in our previous conversation where we have people experimenting with it, and, and especially your interest in the phenomenology of this. Yeah. John Morangi leaves us a clear uh, outline of what what went wrong and why he changed it, and all these terrible visions he had. Mm. But also, I mean, the text the text clearly also is is written towards students. It says like you have to. Yeah. You have to continue going to your lectures. You have to continue reading. So it's not like you do the Ars Notoria in lieu of. Like, yeah, of not doing to, it's, Yeah, it's not like it's not like you just learn everything from nowhere. It's like you still have to be reading the material. And right. Stuff. Yeah. Right. And so it's um, so, yeah. And, you know, I think one could argue about exactly how it's supposed to work. And, you know, do you really just learn all of dialectic all of a sudden, you know, at the end of four months? I don't know. But um, certainly it seems like if you're following a. a spiritual regime let's call it uh that's as vigorous as the one laid out in the Ars notoria one you're going to be very very different than your classmates um mm. people forget that you know the university of paris was known to be a very body yeah it's very, like, you know, like it's, it's sort of like what we imagine like modern college students to be <laughs> yeah it really it's really like i mean it's like sort of like you know frat guys like really just like drinking and gambling and prostitution was out of control and it was just like it was a it was a very I mean, people literally took the tonsure to avoid being arrested. It was it, it mm. was really was a completely wild place. The University of Paris in the Middle Ages was, was by no means a, a tame church mm. boy. So, I mean, they really were like partying pretty hard. And so I think that you would just, one, you would stand out as being especially weirdly studious in that regard. Not that there mm. weren't studious people like Thomas Aquinas or Duns Scotus or whatever. But um, I think if you organize your entire life around study, you're going to get pretty good at it. And if you do it for four months, it yeah. seems it seems likely to me that you're going to get, I mean, you're going to get a lot smarter, a lot faster, because basically you're organizing your entire life around learning. Yeah. I think that will correlate to you learning stuff yeah. faster. Yeah, learning stuff a little better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah it's, 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 so in some ways, it's like the least surprising aspect of it is that now, yeah. now again, um, most magic will make will we'll write checks that it can't cash. It'll tell you that you can turn invisible or, you know, spy on the world, spy on the entire world if you're in the Nokian system or mm. or whatever. You get you riches and have people fall in love with you or find buried treasure. I'm fairly confident that stuff did not often come out in the wash. Mm. But um but I, I am also fairly confident that the phenomenology of it was uh sufficiently powerful that People continued to do it, and they transmitted these texts, and they practiced them, they altered them, they experimented with them. Uh, we know that they were because we have again to go back to the University of Paris in thirteen, what thirteen eighty nine, thirteen ninety eight. They they have mm. to officially release the big condemnation. Yeah, it's the the, 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 the uh, it's like well, it's, it's on the constitution. It's the the mm. the, the, the con, uh, condemnation of sorcery. Right. Yeah. So this, yeah. this is a, you know it's a public you know then they go through all the forms of sorcery that you can't practice. The Ars Notoria is on there. Mm. Um, but again, the University of Paris is a weird place. I mean, that's that's falling on the heels of the 1277 uh, condemnation of Paris, where they, you know, they had to basically expel a bunch of professors for teaching that people didn't have individual souls. I mean, this was a really avant-garde place. Mm. And so, um, and Sigur Brabant teaching the world's eternal. I mean, going right up against standard Christianity. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think that the 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 world of necromantic or magical practices or whatever i think it was pretty ubiquitous pretty ubiquitous um pan-european we have many tradition all over europe and i think that it was uh it was popular also you really wouldn't get in a lot of trouble for it typically this is a misconception people have yeah if if you get caught with a magical book or a grimoire they're going to burn you alive we know of a hand only a handful of people ever burned for this stuff Mm. and um checo Descoli being one but most people uh um, you didn't get in a lot of trouble. You could have the book seized, and mm-hmm. you could you could get in some degree of trouble. You get penances or something, but you're not going to get in that much trouble. And so the risk is relatively low. The reward, or at least the promise of reward, relatively high. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm sure you had a lot of guys. I'm sure every school had a 
took every school had a has a you know I don't know weird D and D click. I'm sure they also those same guys those guys in the Middle Ages are just like the the necromancers. Yeah. So uh, what is it? There's um I've heard I've heard you mention it before actually. I, I've heard a couple of other academics actually, but the whole um uh, with uh, in conjunction with the 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 Paris University actually, uh, but the whole clerical necromantic underground. Yeah, this is Kika's like first term for it. Yeah. yeah, it's like a little clique of little necromancers in in um in, in the university, which is just hilarious to me. Like the fact yeah. that it's like an actual thing. <laughs> it was just, uh, certainly a thing. I mean, these manuscripts don't copy themselves. You yeah. know, they're not they're not moving. They're not moving. We can see the move. We see the move from Italy to Germany, Germany mm-hmm. to France. Uh, we can see their movement, and you know, um, yeah, they're not copying themselves. They're not doing the. And there's there's a group of people, but some people all through Europe. Mm. Um, who are responsible for this tradition, which again is not inimical to Christianity. It only works in, because yeah, works in, the, in context. the context of, of yeah. Christianity. You, you, it, it only this whole system only works in that way. So again, that's what's very fascinating to me. Often occultists don't like Christianity for whatever reason. Mm. Many, I think, in many cases because of like religious trauma. And yeah. of course, Christianity is really scared of occultists, but I'm like, you guys need each other. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, like most of them are the same. Because it's like, it's well, I, mean, I was talking about it the other day. Um, but the vast majority of the compilers, the collectors, the, the you know, the scribes of these things, and also just the, the users of a lot of the grimoires were members of the clergy in and of That's themselves, a- because one, they were the ones who were trained in reading Latin. Well, in general, the whole, the whole grimoire tradition is a, is a what do you call it? It is a noble tradition. It's the tradition of the upper classes because it's literary tradition. Mm-hmm. So um, nine times out of ten, the main people who are going to be able to read are going to be the priests because they're going to be the scribes. Yeah, so certain, it's, it certainly, is kind of hilarious to me. But. Yeah, that's that's the thing, and people just don't. I don't, you know. Yeah, they don't get. I mean, I will say that beginning in some urban centers in the 13th century, we do get some secular people, but there's still people mm-hmm. in lower orders. I mean, there's just no non-Christians. It's just not a world that doesn't exist. It's just not a thing. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, that you know, you get you know, I think Spinoza is from probably the first person that we can identify as a as a secular person who mm. who's expelled from a religion and doesn't convert to another religion. Um, he was a uniquely weird guy in that regard. Maybe yeah. the first secular person in, in European history. But there was no yeah, there was no there was no outside to this. And mm. John D. Cornelius Agrippa, maybe Bruno was a person who had drifted out of Christianity, and he certainly believed in some quite idiosyncratic things. Mm. But you know, all of the you know, go we can run your name through any famous occultist you want prior to basically the the 18th century, 17th century, and they're going to be pious Christians because the system only works. You only have the ability to bind and control demons vis-a-vis the power of Christ. Yeah, or, or 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 I guess God in this sense, right? They're they're, they're calling Adonai or, or Shaddai and all the all sort of the general sort of right. Hebraic God <laughs> names and things like that. Yeah, yeah but it only it only makes sense in that context. So yeah, you I mean you look at the exorcistic, you look at the manuals, right? It's ad te in nomine, blah 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 blah, blah and the blood of the mm-hmm. martyrs, and the, you know it's 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 the the conjuration and the binding language is is exorcistic, and that that works via the power of divine names, mm-hmm. which is a well attested tradition in, in Christianity going back. Yeah, well, well you know, the, yeah, the idea of the divine names are even they, they go back to the PGM yeah. as well, oh. right? They go back to the Greco-Egyptian traditions. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's interesting as well uh, because when you look at especially the exorcistic tradition, a lot of the well, especially the like the medieval uh, manuals. So something like I think like is it the the, Cam- the Cambridge Necromancer manual is medieval or was that more Renaissance? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's more Renaissance. Yeah, yeah it's like fifteen hundred, isn't it? Yeah, early modern. Um, yeah, where it depends on where you want to draw that line. England's. England's a sort of a odd comer to where the Renaissance yeah, and where, where the medieval and early modern people. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. But like, <laughs> especially in the medieval or a lot of the medieval manuscripts, they are kind of, a lot of the conjurations they're using to call the spirit up in the first place. They're like reverse exorcisms. They're just yeah. doing an exorcism in reverse, <laughs> right? Which is just kind of hilarious. It's like a reverse exorcism. Yeah. It's, um, the same, it's the same spiritual technology, basically. Right. It's just, yeah. It's just a transmission in another direction. Hmm. But yeah, it's the language is, I mean, again, I tell people that if you've never had the chance to crack open a medieval Dominican, you know, an exorcist, um, um, exorcist manual, the Dominicans had the best. Uh, they were really the hardcore frontline exorcist people. Yeah. Still are actually these days. The Jesuits are sort of in the wings, but really it's the Dominicans that were all about the exorcistic life. Hmm. Um, but, You'd be you, people would be shocked to look at 
the Munich Necromancer's manual next to a an exorcistic manual and be like, yeah. oh yeah, it's kind of, you know, um, it's just very yeah, similar. It's, yeah, it's very quite, similar. It's quite, quite similar technologies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's like the other. Thing, I guess the other thing that's always interesting to me when you think when we talk about technology is just how much Hebrew appears in the grimoire tradition as a whole. And it's like it's why. It's it's always interesting as to why particularly Hebrew, um, and it's it's it, I mean you can make you can make an argument that it, because it's the Old Testament and people are going to be you know because it's a majority Christian or, or, or Judeo Christian worldview and they're using the Old Testament then they're obviously believing that Hebrew is the divine language because it's the language of the original Bible, sure. But then like why isn't Greek or like Koinic Koinic Greek, which is what the Septuagint is translated from? Why isn't that given the same treatment in magical contexts as Hebrew is? Yeah, uh, the, I think it's what you said. I think that there was a you know, there's a even the PGM, uh, the mm. Israelite God, is is, is yeah, pretty yeah, popular. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's you know he's he's floating around in there as much as anyone else, and it's certainly the case that the Jews were associated with magic and sorcery mm. um, for a very long time, going back to Josephus and stuff. That yeah. know, this was a this was a commonly held belief. Uh, the Romans held this belief as well. It factors into some anti-Semitism stuff in the Middle Ages, of course, as well. Yeah. But I think that I think that the the answer is exactly what you said: is that the the divine language, the divine Ursprache that God spoke the world into being with, according to most medieval people, was Hebrew. Mm. And because this is literally the language by which God abracadabred the world, like literally, I create as I speak. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it literally abracadabred the world into existence, and the then this Hebrew, then Hebrew must itself have some kind of inherent power. And therefore, um, and therefore we can, you know, we can use that. Mm. So, yeah, you see this. And uh, of course, it's also funny because many of these Christians don't know Hebrew very well. So the Hebrew yeah. is very badly corrupted. There's a bunch corrupted. of spelling mistakes and grammar oh. issues and stuff when you read it. Yeah. Oh, it's it's still, uh, even today, I, I look at some, I look at uh, some medieval or some occultist stuff now and they have in Hebrew and I'm like, yeah, yeah that's not like, spelled right. Um, you need to get somebody to check that. Yeah. Um, and uh, but yeah, I think that's the reason why. And of course, also the sacred names tradition. There is this idea that even in the New Testament, you expel demons in the name of Christ. It's, mm. it's done in the name of. There is a power in the name. In the names, yeah. And, and so these divine names uh, that we see going, the divine name tradition, you, these get preserved. Uh, and even in the New Testament, it was clear that language mattered to the writers of that because there are peculiar instances that, despite the fact that the text is written in Koine Greek certain things that Jesus said are preserved in Aramaic. Mm. Um, and the writer of the writers of those texts, for whatever reason, thought those words need to be maintained in the original Aramaic uh, because they had some kind of power. Mm. And so it's interesting that, you know, there's six sayings or six phrases that are preserved in Aramaic or something like that. And so this idea, I think, you know, um, was current at that time. I think, um, and it, you know, it persists, you know, uh, it persisted in the, in, uh, into the magic tradition. So yeah, you see a lot of Hebrew, um, a lot of Hebrew in various states of corruption, but clearly, um, if the language, <clears throat> if the language itself had power, and mm -hmm. most medieval people think thought that it did. In fact, I'm working on an uh, episode for tomorrow on uh, Johann Reuchlin's uh, De Verba Merificio, mm -hmm. where he most systematically makes this argument um, there in 1492 or 1494, late 15th century, and. Um, yeah, I think I think it's an idea. And you see it in Agrippa. I mean, um, in fact, it's that's part of what makes the whole John D stuff so weird. Is yeah. that D D rejects something rejects the idea that it's Hebrew. It's and the Nilkian becomes the it's like the yeah, it's, it's the language of well, I, well, I was yeah, his argument is I think that he like Enochian is a language that Adam spoke to name everything in creation, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, um, or the Liber Loga is just how it's just God's. It's the the written out version of God's speech that created the universe. Mm. So, but yeah, it's the Adamical language. It's the, the celestial speech. It's the, uh, it's the, what is it? The angel, I think it's Gabriel maybe, or Navaj. So it's, it's the language that, uh, that Adam, that Adam spoke with in paradise. Yeah. So, so it's interesting that D goes away from Hebrew and goes in the direction of, of Enochian, mm. but, um, but even people like Agrippa, and that's the reason why all that Hebrew is in Agrippa. And yeah. um, Agrippa tells you, he tells you as much. Right? Mm. So, well, a lot of, yeah, because a lot of Agrippas, especially the, uh, which one is it? Like the third, I think it's the third one, isn't it? Because that's the second, like the first one's on physical magic, second's still, and the third is on sort of ceremonial 
um, a scent, basically. But it's it's basically all Christian Kabbalah, right? It, it's mm-hmm. Christianized Kabbalah, pretty much. Um, yeah. It's very much. Boring. I mean, in fact, in fact, he he quotes. I mean, uh, you know, you know the. Three books of occult philosophy comes in two versions: the mm. the version no one, the juvenile draft written in fifteen ten that no one reads, uh, and then there's the 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 first edition, the mature edition of fifteen thirty three. Mm. The ma, the juvenile draft of fifteen ten, which is I think a, in many ways a more interesting book in many ways, but mm. he quotes from Roycklin constantly in that, literally just pulling out entire sections of uh, on the wonder working word, puts them right into that book, and then mm. later comes back and, and and edits and stuff like that. But yeah, in many ways, you know, Agrippa, um, you know, we, we have Pico developing Christian Kabbalah. Uh, yeah. It gets exported across the Alps by Reuchlin, and it's promulgated uh, through Northern Europe by 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 Agrippa. Mm. Um, and of course, there's no denying that that's the single most, again, influential book. But again, it's one of these books that I think is more celebrated than known. It's it's, yeah. it's, it's not people drop Agrippa's name, but uh, to read through all three books is quite, is quite a chore. Yeah. Well, there was, yeah, because like, I, I think the, the challenge you have with it, I actually have, I have like the new, what you, call, you can see them up there, like the new uh, three books edition, mm-hmm. uh, which is I think one of the like, more recent translations of it. Um, but one of the challenges you always, or I've, I've always found with the Gripper is especially if you read any of the English translations and you read his Latin, like the original Latin translations, a lot of the modern English translators, like, what's the way of putting it? A Gripper is very eloquent in his Latin. Like yeah. he is, like he is just like he's <clears> such a he. Like his use of language and his its craft and everything is so beautiful. Like his rhetoric and all of it is so clear that a lot of people when they translate it to English, they kind of miss the rhetoric. They don't translate it properly, so it just doesn't give you enough of a a, a full picture of like him as a person. And I think understanding the context of Agrippa as a guy and how like his backstory and everything, how that contributed to him writing everything, because people have this impression that. Um, the, the three books for cult philosophy, or, or I mean, if you're if we're also including the sort of pseudo fourth book a little bit, but that it like all three of them are kind of just like a like a catalog textbook of just everything that's going on in the Middle Ages, and like to a certain extent they are like, but I, it, it, to some extent it is where he's just sort of he's collating all of the wisdom that's going on in the Renaissance, but they're all there's so much more than that. Like the 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 three books are a reformation really of magic, oh, like of course, shaping yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's and it's also the books are highly systematic. You just can't start reading middle of book two. Yeah, it, it, the, it's a it's a very it's a, it's 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 like a medieval summa. It's like a summa mm-hmm. magica. I say, it's very it's very it's in that tradition of something like Thomas Aquinas as summa theologica. So yeah, it's a, it's a highly systematic text um, that you have to really read it from the beginning to end. Uh, it has a logic to it. It, it works on, on certain parameters, and. Um, yeah, it's he he is collating a lot, but he also is, you know, he's really heavily taking he, he it is a decisive break with the earlier theories of magic. Mm. Um, you know, Agrippa had nothing good to say about Goetia and demon summoning. Yeah. I thought all that stuff was terrible. Um, and and it, people forget Johann Weyer, his his student, was one of the first people to really mm. come out and say, like, hey, all this witchcraft hunting stuff is terrible. Yeah. Uh, Johann Weyer really, I mean, you, you really want to see sort of the logical progression of how um agrippa's thought developed you can see it in fire but um but yeah you know agrippa really disdained uh, the more medieval grimoire tradition and really thought that what he really wanted what he wanted to create was a system of magic that exalted the human being in a way of of reuniting them with with the divine mm. so in that way the text is very modern it feels very modern mm. Uh, but you're right to say Agrippa style, stylistically is a quite he's quite a good Latinist. You know, he was uh, infamously arrogant as a as a teenager, where he would only yeah. speak in Latin, and he would force people to speak in Latin with him. And uh, he was known for these uh, rhetorical flourishes and, and things like this. And he's quite caustic. If you ever read some of his letters, um, he can be really a, a jackass. And um, a lot of those guys back then could be. But um, on in De Incertitude, which uh, again most occultists never read. Mm. They don't like the idea that Agrippa probably backed off on most of that stuff, but uh, in De Incertitude, it is just a all un, it's just a constant assault on what's yeah. known, including what we know about about magic. So it's a that's that is in many ways also a very very fun text, and in some ways prefigures Descartes. Descartes read it. We know Descartes read it before he mm-hmm. uh, before he did his famous parabolic doubt. Yeah, that he was uh, inspired to that doubt at some level by uh, Agrippa's. Uh, on the on the uncertainty of the arts and sciences 
Mm. Yeah, because it, it's it's one of those weird things. Because I think when when we read the Jake Howard Tune, though, it's <clears throat> I feel like it, it, it's a critique. Like, what's the best way of putting it? It, it feels like it's a he's making a critique of just almost like Arist- like the whole Aristotelian philosophy of learning rather than specific like any specific like branch or any specific discipline he's like critiquing h- how things are learned and like the groundwork on how on how people are, or the bedrock really on how people are building things up um but it is a, just it is a very weird progression because you go from you go from that into the of cult philosophy and it's like he's kind of just going back and forth in his mind of like what's going on um, and it, it, would, it would be such an interesting dynamic if I had like a time machine to go back and like see his progression, like how yeah. his mind changes because he goes through all of that and then goes into the three occult uh, philosophy books when it's just like such a drastic change. But then it's like, in a way, I guess it's not though because he's like if you if you read it in order, he's he starts off by attacking the way in which everything is being learned, and then if you read the occult or the three books of occult philosophy as a reformation of magic, as a reformation of learning, then it kind of makes sense to, as as to his logical progression, I guess. Right. And I think that the role of faith, I mean, again, this is a Christian mm. text. The role of faith is I mean, central to De Incertitude. That's the whole point: is that you mm. cannot nothing is a substitute for faith. No amount of knowledge is as a substitute for faith, and that's ultimately what drives the the three books. And so the the thread that binds them is the reliance on faith, and in, and in many ways that sort of makes a, um, a, a grippa a kind of proto Protestant of a certain kind. Mm. This hardcore emphasis on faith. Of course, we'll see that you know, Martin Luther again. Mm. Uh, but you know, again, people forget. You know that that 1533 when um, when uh, when when Agrippa is writing this. You know the big religious wars. You know the you know Thomas Munzer's the. Mm. Uh, the big battle there with Munzer is 1525. I mean, this is the kind of thing that Agrippa would have known about. He was a mercenary. Mm. I mean, he didn't, you know, he didn't known about this stuff. And so I think in many ways also, there's just in Northern Europe, especially in Nettesheim and the areas where he grew up, you know, with the Trithemius and those guys, um, already that, you know, m- Protestantism wasn't popular because of Luther, just the genius of whatever. It was already in the air mm. and there were competing, competing versions of it. And I, I, you know, when you say Reformation, I really think not just Reformation in the sense of a Reformation vis-a-vis magic in the Grimoire tradition, but really also um, to put Agrippa into the situation of the religious friction that's happening, mm. and for him to, to for you one to see how the three books fits into this world of uh, quite violent and quite dynamic religious tensions, and the three books um, um, is much more intelligible in that context. Yeah. So again, it's just why I really, you know, from the way that I approach this material, you know, I tell people, look, if you want to be a good occultist, you're going to have to do some history because yeah. these books have histories. They have contexts, they have languages, they have, they have uh, metaphysical commitments that may not be anything like the metaphysical commitments that, that we have now. You know, I, I think of the idea of like the active intellect, you know, mm. I don't think anyone believes in the active intellect now, mm. but the active intellect was a core component of how, intellection and god's mind and all this stuff happened in the middle ages and mm. this is a concept that maybe outside of philosophy programs you'll never hear about yeah um, but this is you know the, the core component of renaissance magic and and things like this so yeah. but it's just again it just shows uh you know that doesn't that doesn't delegitimate anyone's magical practices or what no. have you but what i would say is that everybody who does want to practice um at least you know the more heady yeah, ceremonial like, stuff. Yeah, like the manuscript traditional grimoire yeah. tradition, or yeah, like I, that. Yeah, yeah. I think that you know a class of medieval philosophy would 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 serve them would serve them uh, very very well. I mean, um, just because again, the way that we think about the world since Kant and since Newton is mm. utterly unlike the world of Aristotelian scholasticism. Yeah, um, and even that world sort of again, it's not just Arist- Aristotelian scholasticism; it's also imbued with a heavy dose of. A peculiar kind of Neoplatonism, via things like the book of the the book of the perfect good and and mm. the theology of Aristotle, things like that. So there's also again a a, a very strongly uh, Platonic element running through it. So mm. it's not even strict Aristotelianism that that's been forming it. So yeah, I think that people would benefit. I think their magical practice would benefit from understanding how the worldview in the philosophical and metaphysical machinery that these people believed in. That's how mm. they saw their universe. That you know, I think these texts would make a lot more sense that way. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's it's, <clears throat> it's 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 such an interesting conversation, I think, because 
especially when you look at I mean, even if you take it, take out the context of like occultism, esotericism, and you just talk, sort of talk about the wider spiritual community as a whole at this moment. Um, one of the big things that always kind of turned me off or turned me away from, I guess you can say like new age sources or anything like that, is they seem to have this habit. And again, this isn't me disparaging in any sort of particular uh, spiritual practice or faith or anything like that. But it's just an observation. But they seem to just kind of take uh, a lot of these concepts that they have for granted you know and um especially when you, when you look at into when you sort of look at like what, tip, like what is typically sort of new age nowadays stuff you know like crystals manifestation uh the whole atlantis lemuria theosophy stuff the vast majority of it <clears throat> is just like very bog standard theosophy it's like it, it, it's like it's not really changed that much since sort of the 1800s helena Blavatsky's kind of stuff um and like a really good example of that is something about like the Kabbalion. Right, where people kind of have this idea that the Kabbalion is a hermetic text, but it's but it markets really itself kind of as such. A, yeah, well, yeah. So it, yeah, it markets yeah. itself. But in fact, I think in the in in the introduction of it, it actually says this is like this is one of the lost books of Hermes, or it's like one of the lost books of the of the original Hermetica. Um, but it's not. It, it's a new thought text, right? right and it's it's yeah. a Victorian text. Right. Um, and this is the thing. So I've, I've talked about this on a podcast before, but the stuff in there isn't. Like I have no problem with it. It's it's perfectly fine. It's just sort of standard stand spiritual philosophy. But it's just kind of like your very bog standard theosophy, and people kind of apply to it and they think it's kind of something bigger than it is. I think, and it's kind of an interesting idea. And it, it makes me it makes yeah it it brings to mind what you were saying earlier, where it's like it's one of those books that's more celebrated than known because even though people read it, they don't understand the context or the history of how it's actually constructed or made, right? And because of that, they take it at face value. And that's yeah. kind of it. That's as deep as that's as deep as people's understanding of it goes. Yeah, and I think yeah, every, <clears throat> everyone's going to benefit from historiography. Everyone's going to yeah. benefit from knowing the context. You know, I get this with alchemy all the time. People sometimes mm. get upset when I make alchemy videos because they're like, "Why are you talking about metals so much?" I'm like, "Well, because yeah. actual alchemy was about transforming metals. It wasn't about psychology. Like Jung invented that. Yeah, it's not about it's not. It wasn't medieval self help. That's just not what it was, or mm. what have you." And people often are like, yeah, but I've read everywhere that it's it's about it's not about metals, it's about the inner transformation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm like, it's like self-transformation. Yeah. Yeah. It's like self-help in the Middle East. Like, nah, I'm like, no, like I hate to break it to you, but basically no one before the 19th century thought that. Mm. Um <clears throat> and so yeah, I think that if you um I, mean, I don't know if it's a particularly unique problem to occultism or esotericism. But I do think that it is a problem that I do notice in those mm -hmm. uh, in the in the field where there is a kind of ahistoricality. Yeah, and you know that makes some sense because I think what people are looking for often in these texts and in spirituality in general is a kind of trans historical experience yeah. of God or the One or truth, and that very quest of a trans historical, non historical, maybe even a historical search for the good, the beautiful, and the just, or uh, these kinds of spiritual concepts, it, it runs a it runs a ground of of history because once you put things into history. Um, you know, they get messy and you yeah. realize that you know that um yeah alchemy is not about spiritual transformation it's just yeah. it's not it, it it can be now and certainly people make it about that but mm. um but yeah i think that that's i don't know if it, it i don't know if it, i would say it irks me but i think that i feel that people who do identify as spiritual practitioners are actually more bereft because they don't have access to that history mm. than i think empowered to to be spiritually, I don't know, to do their spirituality better. I think yeah. that when we have cultural intellectual amnesia, I don't think that anyone actually benefits from that. Yeah. Yeah. This, and, this is, yeah, this, this is such an, uh, such an interesting discussion. I, I, I want to get your opinion on, on this actually. Yeah. It's uh, sparked my mind or it's sparked a memory for me now. Um, but it always, I, I've had, I, I always ask uh, any other podcast guests this kind of thing, but it, it, it's in the same line. But where, in your opinion, do you think we there if there is a line between sort of historical practice and coming in and, and and staying true to understanding how these texts emerged, how these traditions, how these ideas even emerged, staying true to that and actually situating things within history, and then also having or holding space for, I guess, what we can say is like personal gnosis, personal experience and things like that, right? And as an example, I think one that I always like to use and get people's opinions on 
is the dynamic that uh, Foth, so the Egyptian god Foth, has undergone in modern spiritual circles is absolutely fascinating to me. Because we look at, you know, you look at any of the historical Egyptian inscriptions, you look at any, even in the PGM where Foth appears and things like that. Both is like we have so much written on him. Like it, it, it's like you can't really misinterpret Egyptian gods because we just have so much written down about right. them nowadays. But then in the modern circles, a lot of modern spiritual circles, people, you know, they talk about Foth as like an, uh, a figure from Atlantis and a wisdom figure, that kind of thing, where people are channeling them, mostly theosophists from the 1800s onwards, who are channeling him as kind of like a divinized wisdom figure or sort of an ahistorical version of him. Evidently, when you're looking at all these channels, people like that, they're having some kind of experience. Evidently, like they are like in terms of a phenomenological thing. Sure. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm in no position to critique them and say that they're not having an experience. But to what extent can we sort of talk about a, a, the, the, there being a space for people's personal gnosis or their, their personal idea and interpretation of what something is versus situating that inside of a historical current because something just doesn't add up there for me? Because uh, it's going to be like one or the other, I feel, but I also don't know if it's that simple. Yeah, I, that's a good question, and I have to say that I'm not a practitioner, so I can't, yeah, you know, sure. can't, you know, I, I don't want to speak for practitioners. But I, I will say that you know, as a as a Jewish person who is also committed to modernity, you know, the form of Judaism I practice is called Reconstructionism, mm. and the and the way Reconstructionism orients itself is it says that the tradition has to have a vote, but it can't have a veto. And so the tradition informs how we do Judaism now, right? We are always reconstructing Judaism. Judaism isn't a thing. It's, it's a thing people do. And so hmm. it's not like a, you know, there's no way to do it. It's just how it gets done. And so the, 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 in order to give the tradition that vote, you have to do the hard work of going back to the Bible, going to the Talmud, going legal codes. Mm-hmm. You have to do all the work of going back to the tradition. And the tradition gets a vote and you have to give it that vote. Hmm. But the vote, it never gets a veto. It doesn't say, all right, so back in the day, we used to believe that, I don't know, in geocentrism. Well, that's the thing we should learn about. We should understand why the medieval rabbis believed in geocentrism. We should understand how that affect, um, the, how that shaped their worldview and metaphysics and the mechanics in the universe. And it does not get a veto on the fact that that's not true. <laughs> you know, it doesn't get a veto on uh, on whatever. And so I think that for me, when I think about how I practice my religion is that um, I want my tradition to be as alive as possible. You know, mm. I want it to be as accessible and I want to be in a relationship with that tradition as much as possible. But the moment that the tradition becomes um, a straitjacket where you can no longer, you know, have creativity, you can no longer innovate, you can no longer um, modernize. Uh, at that point, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going mm. to let tr- tr- the tradition uh, bogart me into you know, treating women a certain kind of way or being homophobic or something. Mm-hmm. So, um, so there is a dialectic there. And I think that, um, that the answer there is, and you know, my typical Hegelian answer is that um, we're always reconstructing and anyone who thinks that we're not, you know, they're being real trad. No one, the idea of being trad is a reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're, you're doing the reconstructing. Like no one, no one who lived a traditional life ever thought of themselves as doing that. Yeah. Um, that's a response to modernity and so, uh, or post-modernity or whatever. And so, um, and so I would say that you're always reconstructing and you're always in a dialectic with tradition. And if you, insofar as you are in a dialectic with tradition, do you need to, it, it, it is, it is in your interest to understand that tradition as well as possible. Mm. Um, because if not, and I think theosophy is a great example of this, because if you don't, you're going to unconsciously end up inheriting a bunch of really bad ideas from the past. Yeah. Uh, and theosophy is full of all kinds of crazy racist stuff. I mean, the Atlantis I, stuff. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's knee deep and, in, in, you know, you know, really, really 19th century, really like, you know, uh, uh, 19th century colonial racist ideas. Yeah. And that's not to say that theosophy is doomed to those kinds of ideas, but it is to say that if you aren't being careful with your traditions, ideas that you may not like or even agree with. Um, can 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 continue on in your traditions, and you know, I don't think that's what people want. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that the, the the issue is not about whether or not we shelve tradition or or, or do whatever we want, personal analysis. I think that the answer has to be that there has to be some kind of relationship between the two, 
And that the only way to, the only way for that relationship to be healthy is to really understand your tradition well. And if you're going to not accept something from the tradition under, you know, understand what you're getting rid of. So you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, yeah. but also, um, you know, the better we understand history and the better we understand the origins of these things, the richer they are, um, not, you know, that doesn't, if we understand that the Zohar is a 13th century forgery, basically, that doesn't take away from the, the amazing theosophical speculations that arose out of it. Mm. Um, it, it historicality doesn't invalidate it. It just situates it in a way that makes it actually more concretely real. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'd also, I, I'd also be curious actually on, on that note, um, I guess in your case, as, as a, uh, as a, as Jewish, um, on your, your opinion on Kabbalah, uh, whether would you consider Kabbalah a closed practice nowadays, or would you think it's, it's more of an open one? I, I would say that, I mean, I, I would say as a non-Orthodox Jew, um, mm. I would say that there is no way of being a Kabbalist without being an Orthodox Jew. Yeah. It's not, it's not that it's closed or open. It's just that it is the Kabbalah assumes as a default that you are not only doing all the commandments that the, the Bible um, enforces, but that you're even doing extra stuff like these tikkunim mm. and other kinds of very particular kinds of specifically Kabbalistic practices. Mm. So it's not that it's closed or opened or whatever. Uh, it's just that I think that the way that the Kabbalah understands itself is that it, it's, it, even in the Zohar, it, it doesn't like the idea that there are Jews out there not rigorously practicing the law. Mm. Um, so I would say even as a non-Orthodox Jew, I'm not sure that I could be a Kabbalist. Because yeah. of even if I wanted to be, which I don't, but even if I wanted to be, I think that it requires a kind of uh, extraordinary commitment to Orthodox Judaism as a default, like yeah. uh, the default. And so, yeah, I, it's not that, you know, people say, well, can Jews do or not do Kabbalah? I would say, no, you need to turn it up even higher than that. The question is not yeah. whether Jews or non-Jews, it's whether even non-Orthodox Jews can really do Kabbalah. And when I read the classic texts of Kabbalah, the Zohar, uh, the Kidvayari, the, you know, m- all these major texts, they assume orthodoxy, yeah. stringent orthodoxy. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not about closed or open. It's about whether or not uh, you, Kabbalah is built upon a foundation of orthodoxy. Mm. So imagining outside of that doesn't doesn't make it doesn't yeah it, it makes the system kind of <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Yeah, because it's. <sighs> It, it's it, in in a way it kind of, it kind of irks me this whole the whole idea of hermetic kabbalah kind of irks me a little bit um, purely in the sense of how much it's been appropriated by modern occultists and in a manner of speaking or sort of I guess you could say like the, the casual occultists I guess you could say or maybe maybe the spiritualists um, but you look at the, you look at sort of what we what we would dub as traditional kabbalah or I guess Lurianic kabbalah or anything of that kind of tradition. Um, and compare it to sort of the Hermetic Kabbalah that was derived by the Golden Dawn uh, and anything that, any of those kind of systems. Um, and like the Hermetic Kabbalah is a really beautiful system. Like if you look at it in its context and how the Golden Dawn used it, I think it is an incredible system. Um, but there is a part of it that I can't, I can't deny, I think, that I have to just sort of speak to every time it sort of comes up, uh, that feels a little bit of resistance to it when I see a lot of people, especially in modern spiritual communities, using things like the tree of life as a tarot spread in Hermetic Kabbalah, where it's like, <sighs> you're kind of like, like to, to, to strip the tree of life down to something as simplistic as a tarot spread. Like, yes, there are correspondences, you know, the way the tarot moves through different sephirot in the, in the Hermetic system. But it's like something about that, and I can't quite put my finger on what it is, like something about people using the tree of life as a simple tarot spread just kind of irks me. Where like when you look at it in comparison to how the system works in traditional Durianic Kabbalah. It's like there's such a huge difference. And then people calling themselves Kabbalists in comparison to that, right? Yeah. I, I mean, again, it just as a person who studies a lot of traditional Kabbalah, mm. it's not that it's not that I think it's wrong or something, or even like cultural appropriation. I just don't I think that, you know, it's like the same with a spoiler, right? Like at what point yeah. at what point, you know, and and uh, at what point in Titanic can you say that this boat's gonna sink? I mean, it's <laughs> it's not a spoiler to you know, you know, tell someone the boat's gonna sink. Mm. The the truth of the matter is that Kabbalah of some form has been outside of the Jewish world um since the late 15th century. Mm. And um we can talk about the really tortured history of all that and how that has, you know, there's lots of 
bad things about that. But also, the spiritual technologies are just not going to get confined, mm. you know, in communities. They're, they're going to get out. And many Jews actively tried to get them out because they really thought that it was going to, you know, sort of um, force the the imminent redemption of, yeah. of humankind by publishing the Kabbalah. Age and stuff. Yeah, it was really a it was really a thing of you know, and, and some Jews still believe things like that. So I, I just the cultural appropriation bit just doesn't bother me in the same way uh, because mm. it's the same sort of spoiler alert thing. It's like we know the boat's going to sink. Mm. There's no there's no getting the genie back in the bottle, and if someone finds that laying the tarot spread out using the tree of life is spiritually helpful for them great mm. like I, i'm not gonna I'm not gonna like yuck their yum i guess yeah um but what i would say is that like i would encourage them to dig deeper and to really get into the mechanics of why the sphero why is that even there why why the tree of life configuration why that configuration and not other configurations that we know of like the parts of theme are the uh, nested configuration that was actually more popular very early on mm. um, are other configurations because, you know, we see the tree of life with its perfectly balanced sphere wrote, but that's the goal of Kabbalah. It's not like that now. Mm, right. The, the sphere wrote are constantly moving around and constantly out of balance and moving about. Uh, they're, they're in a dynamic relationship with each other. And so even the idea that there can, they can be sort of made static and then put into correspondences with something it's an idea so foreign to traditional Kabbalah, um, you know, that I don't, it does for a traditional Kabbalah person, they'd be like, that's really weird and mm. not how we understand this at all. So what I would say is I would hope that it would be the, rather than say, Hey, you can't do this because it's closed practice and it's Judaism. Sure. I would never say something like that. What I would say is be more curious about where this stuff came from and learn mm. the history of it and learn that it's messy. Yeah. Um, it's pretty messy. And, but at the same time, um, you know, Jewish texts, texts of Kabbalah, they're out there. People can study them. They can be, I think they would benefit people uh, who are interested in spirituality. So I'd much rather shift the conversation toward let's deepen your spiritual practice by learning more about Kabbalah than say, no, let's close the doors and you can't lay the tarot cards out like that. Mm. Um, this is a position I've, I have on the channel where um, I always think that it's better to educate than criticize. Yeah. So that's why you'll never see on Esoterica like debunking videos. You'll never right. see me. You'll never, you, I, I don't ever do things like that. I never go to someone else's. I never go to like the crazy Atlantis guys YouTube channel and then like comment on his videos. I, I could do that, but I don't feel like I'd much rather you educate people about, I'd rather deepen their knowledge. And if they find the crazy Atlantis guy to be silly at that point, great. Mm. But me taking digs at the, Aryan Atlantis guy or the hermetic Dawn, golden dawn stuff. I, w I don't, I'm not interested in doing that because I'd rather deepen someone's spiritual practice by getting to ask, ask more probing questions about the origins of this stuff mm. than, than tell people I was close practice. I don't, um, but yeah, I would say, you know, people who are interested in Kabbalah and things like that, they should, you know, strike up an opera uh, relationship with their local synagogue and, you know, be in community with the spiritual traditions that matter to you. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I think that's super important, and I, I think the other thing that does actually, especially if we're go, if you're going out into like actual practicing a lot, like I guess we could say alive spiritual communities, is it makes you remember how much of a, of a living system these things are, right? Because I think I think you've talked about this before, but it's very easy with something like Kabbalah to make the assumption that the Kabbalah that we have today has always existed in the way that it has existed. Um, but in reality, Kabbalah has kind of, like, I guess you could say for the last 800, maybe 1,000 years, something like that. Um, it's been the predominant, sure, it's, it's been the predominant form of, I guess you could say, Jewish mysticism. But it's by no means the only form of Jewish mysticism, right? You, you know, no one seems to talk about uh, like Merkava or Hechelot literature or anything like that in, in any sort of same, well, with the same kind of reverence or, or ability to practice or anything like that, right? And I guess a lot of... Uh, like whether it was whether you're going into like Israelite prophecy and things like that, and the ecstatic states that these sort of systems are derived from, because evidently like these are when we're dealing with mysticism, we're dealing with ecstatic states and, and non-rational modes of experience, and the vast majority of these systems, if we were to strip away all of the kind of cultural context of them at, the, at their core, they're about triggering altered states of consciousness. I think right, and they're about some of them, yeah. Yeah, it's all, all like, you know, getting esoteric knowledge and that kind of thing. Um, and it, it's just kind of fascinating to me that people don't 
look at uh, or they don't acknowledge and see the, the how the history develops or and how these systems develop. Because um, yeah. I get like Merkaba and Heckel literature is fascinating. Oh, I love um, that stuff. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. And and people forget that you know that the Merkaba Heckel literature as a form of Jewish mysticism has existed for just slightly longer than Kabbalah. In fact, mm. people forget that in the Zohar, there are Hechelot sections of the Zohar. Um, mm. The writer of the Zohar really, really thought of themselves as part of a bringing that literature in. And so it's so that there are Hechelot sections, big Hechelot sections in the, in the, in the Zohar as well. So, yeah, um, I would say that, that these things have a history. They change. Um, you know, even saying Lurianic Kabbalah, we, this is a phrase we just use. Yeah. But, you know, Lurianic Kabbalah, there's not agreed upon in the literature in the actual Lurianic literature mm. if you compare um because you know Luria had more students than Chaim Vital we just typically use Chaim Vital's version as mm. the representative of Luria's ideas we know that Chaim Vital intentionally obfuscated some of Luria's ideas because he was uncomfortable with them mm. so and then two the earlier most the earlier published version of the Lurianic Kabbalah was actually published by a guy named Israel Sarug that no one talks about in the Sarugian Kabbalah, it's probably closer in some ways to Isaac Luria's actual positions. And mm. so even when we talk about Lurianic Kabbalah, you know, we have the standard simsum and all this sort of these ideas, but um, that's a lot messier than people realize. Um, yeah. So it's, again, it's one of these things where I would tell people, um, it's it's an odd thing to have to tell someone who's interested in esotericism that they need to dig deeper because obviously they're already digging pretty deep. Yeah. Um, but the rabbit hole is, is a lot deeper than I think even esotericists uh, take for granted. And um, this is also a place where I would tell people that um, your esoteric mileage is going to be grossly limited by not knowing languages. So mm. like Latin is an absolute must. Yeah. Now, I have to say that you can't be an esotericist without learning Latin, but uh, I will say that, um, you know, not every book is on not every book is uh, on Google and not everything is out there. And um, some things don't have translations yet. It's amazing. You know, for instance, I'm doing an episode on this uh, Reuchlin text, the Verba Merficio, had a huge impact on D, huge impact, quoted in big chunks by Agrippa. There's no English translation. It just doesn't mm -hmm. exist. Yeah. If you want to read it, you can read it in Latin. Um, and so this is just the world that we're in. I think that will slowly change, but um, never underestimate the power of taking two semesters of latin or hebrew or greek yeah. or coptic or whatever um again to really deepen your spiritual practice because there's something about being able to hear these people in their original language and appreciate them not just as spiritual innovators but as like writers mm. of course you mentioned agrippa he's a great writer he's fun to read mm. um it's it's pleasurable to read uh, agrippa's latin so yeah or Ficino's latin or something like that so yeah, i would tell mm. people um one of the easiest ways to profoundly deepen your 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 knowledge of all this stuff is to go back to the ancient languages mm. yeah absolutely i i think uh i mean you mentioned pacino there as well um uh, i think that is something that's seen like the bit that, that's always difficult for me a bit to grasp it is, is when you look at any of the hermetic literature especially like it's it's such a, a it's, it's like it's such a sad scene for me because it, it sets up how the difference between sort of how philosophy is perceived in in the academy and how magic and esotericism is perceived in the academy, because a lot of the what we I guess we could say is the philosophical quote unquote hermetica has been is, or is translated right. We have we have uh, obviously the Corpus Hermeticum by Ficino, uh, which has been translated to English. Uh, I think Brian Copenhaver did a really good mm -hmm. one. Um, yeah, it's the best then, the best one in English. Ficino's yeah. translation is a mess, by the way. People don't yeah, really I've realize. Heard, this. I've heard this. Like his Latin, yeah. his Latin isn't super great. Oh, it's think. not. It's it's not so much that the sections he does translate, he does it pretty, he does a pretty good job. But right. it was never meant for publication. It was published without his authorization, and uh, okay. it was never finished yeah. really. So there are whole chunks missing and stuff. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, it is a, it is a, a, a much more messy text than people realize. That yeah. Um, which is funny because it it would it precipitated because it was so weirdly translated sometimes badly translated people really tried to make sense of it and mm. by trying to make sense of it they added all kinds of other weird things in right and, it, it, and people you know and we, even I mean, within Ficino's lifetime there was already a better translation Lazarelli's translation were was mm. better and more complete it contained all 17 of the hermetic logoi uh, Ficino's only contained the first 14 um 
that manuscript, by the way, still survives. You can see Ficino's notes in the manuscript that he was working on, which is kind of mm. neat. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just funny a place where in history where this document, because of a kind of a rush job and unfinished and, un, and an unauthorized publication of it, um, created more hermetic mysteries, which I just love. Yeah, just yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a funny one. I, I know, it's like, especially, I mean, you could even argue, like, in in a weird kind of way, like the hermetica really kind of embodies, or, the, or I guess the corpus hermeticum, uh, really embodies the philosophy of the Renaissance, the whole sort of ad fontes thing. It, it, like, it oh, really is kind of like the text of the Renaissance that everyone kind of flocks to. Oh, of course. Um, I mean, it's because if you really do believe in the Prisca Theologia, right, that, that mm-hmm. really the primordial wisdom was to be had. The primordial wisdom was the best wisdom and it was had by Moses and Pythagoras and Zoroaster and Hermes Trismegistus. And of course, yeah, he rushed to translate it. Yeah. I think people make too big of a deal of the fact that Ficino interrupted his Plato translation to translate it. Uh, people, yeah. I think that people make that out to be like, oh, stop the presses. We now have Hermes Trismegistus. I think yeah. he stopped the presses basically because, you know, the, it took him uh, 14 years or whatever to do the whole uh, platonic corpus mm. i mean the hermetica is it's not that long you know yeah, really, it's, yeah he, it's not he, yeah and so i think he was just like i can just take a break on my weekend off and like do this corpus medicum thing so i think it was less this sort of stop the presses we found the truth and more uh more just it was a a, a a logistics thing and i say that because if you go to actual actually facino's works he now hardly ever references it mm. Yeah, it's it's not something that comes up a lot for him, is it? Yeah. yeah. Look, I mean, saying that it's interesting because I think you people would. I mean, saying this in a weird kind of way, I, I think the influence of Plato on Western esotericism is drastically undervalued, or it's just not talked enough about enough at all, which yeah. is just mind blowing to me. Um, yeah, and and I would say Neoplatonism by extension. You know, Proclus has had a more Proclus yeah. has had a more Iamblichus has had a bigger impact than people realize. But yeah, we don't really read. Proclus and Damasius. And... Yeah, you don't hear about it in, in modern occultists. I, I, I've heard about it a, a bit because, like, uh, it, it's one of those weird situations. I've heard about it coming from the more kind of, I guess you could say, it's like armchair occultists, like the scholar occultists who are like, oh, you guys should read Plato. It's coming from that way, but I haven't seen any of it come from like the reconstructionists or anyone, any of the actual practitioners, um, which is kind of weird because, like, if you read, you know, on the mysteries, you read Iamblichus and he like transforms theogy into an entire ritual system. Mm-hmm. So the material and, is there to read. Right. Oh, yeah. Just, it's, um, engaging oh, it. It's just kind of weird. Yeah. And I would say Middle Platonism. I've made the argument that there is no Hermeticism without Middle Platonism. Middle Platonism yeah. is just the, uh, is, you know, uh, people like Numenius and Philo are basically the the intellectual backbones behind the behind the, Cormet, the Corpus Hermeticum. You know, it's mm. where we have this Platonism synthesized with Stoic esotericism, which sounds weird, but you know, Posidonius pioneered the idea of cosmic sympathy. There just yeah. is no modern magic. There is no Western magic without the theory of sympathy. Right. And that was that was developed by the Stoics in the Middle Stoa. And but yeah, moments no one's reading Posidonius or are these guys. And so yeah, I think that again, it's not to say that people can't practice whatever they want to practice. No. Yeah. You know? But it did but it would, I think, really radically deepen people's practice to understand. The theory of the forms better to understand the idea of the active intelli- the intellect to understand Iamblichus' theory of, of theurgy or Proclus's. Um, and again, I would say to people to people the elements of theology by Proclus. Uh, it is just one of the most mind blowing texts yeah. in terms of Neoplatonic theology. Yeah. Uh, even the idea of like things like the astral body. Uh, right, well, we, even, even like the like the like the yeah well the astral, the astral plane even mm-hmm. is Platonic. In, in itself, right? Because the astral, astral is is celestial. It, it's the stars, it's the planets, right? The people, especially in like modern New Age communities, they've, they've appropriated it. Or I guess that's not the right word. They've interpreted it as like some kind of like I don't know quasi material form that exists. But in reality, it, it is entirely a Platonic concept. But astral projection forms like the backbone of a lot of modern spiritual practices, and yet no one seems to talk about the fact that it comes from Plato. Yeah, or at least it appears. I mean, I think the Theosophists are picking it up, origin up from the East. But yeah, there's a yeah. tradition of it in, in Proclus and, and and Plato as well. So yeah, I think it's just again, it's just um, we're very lucky this stuff survives. A lot of it didn't, you know. Like if Aristotle survived in one manuscript in a Roman basement. If it had not been for that one manuscript, we'd have lost all of Aristotle. Basically, mm. we're lucky to have what we have, and we are living in a time period where. You can get access to all this stuff relatively inexpensively and really good translations and, mm. you know, in a way that, you know, 
Agrippa couldn't, mm. um, or John D or whatever. And so we live in a place in a time where we really have access to such enormous intellectual resources that a library card can get yeah. you access to this stuff. And, um, yeah, like Iamblichus, Proclus, Damasius, um, yeah, these guys are, if you're reading the Corpus Medicum and not reading the other stuff, I think you're, again, you're reading it in a weird context free environment that I think yeah. makes it look a lot more weird than it is. But when we mm-hmm. actually read this, when you read other historical documents at the same time, you're like, oh yeah, like there's a reason why the Corpus Medicum looks the way that it does. And uh, not to say that it, that makes it less important. Uh, it, it just highlights how actually it is innovative and, um, and how it was and how it wasn't innovative, I suppose. Mm. But yeah, I think that these texts are really, really instrumental. And um, yeah, it is again, odd to me when I uh, hear people who are practicing, especially ceremonial magic. And like, I don't have, I haven't really spent the time with these texts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, again, I'm not saying that it can or it can or it, it, it does or doesn't work. It's not for me to say, but um, I know that I couldn't understand anything going on on these texts if I didn't have that yeah. philosophical background. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the, the, going back to the Hermetica real quick, you know, it's, it's the part that's upsetting to me. I was touching on this earlier, actually, I think. Um, Cause like I said, the, the vast majority of what we can dub as the philosophical Hermetica are translated. And obviously I think I've mentioned this before, actually a couple of times on this channel and, and before in classes and things, but philosophical and technical, even though they are, you know, useful labels for us, they're entirely modern conceptions. There was no distinction in the ancient world for it. Right. Um, but the vast majority of, of the philosophical Hermetica has been translated, which I think is obviously the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, the Asclepius, the Armenian definitions, uh, and then the Oxford and Vienna papyri. I think there is also an Arabic one. It's like the Rebuke of the Soul or something like that. I think it's classed as as philosophical. Yeah, and then, yeah, there's a you know ton of fragments basically. You yeah, know, you know, we have uh, you know Litva has volume, you know, the whole volume two of his Hermetica, which is. Mm. Um, uh, big big stuff that's also from other you know qu- quotations from the philosophical Hermetic and other works. Yeah, I just yeah, there's the um, the Stabea, uh, fragment, the fragments yeah, of the Yeah, that's the other big one. Um, but then when you look at any of the any of the technical Hermetica, because the vast majority of it is in in Arabic or in Latin and Greek, there, like we have so little of it in yeah. English translations. Like there's so so much Arabic uh technical medica and it's uh, it's stuff that's really interesting actually i was i was looking at uh like the list of the available track fragments and manuscripts we have and there's a there's a hermetic manuscript on like the nature or like the esoteric nature of earthquakes and things like that as well which is a hermetic manuscript um and other really really weird ones that are very esoteric really really weird but none of it's translated Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a huge, huge shame to me because I'm like, I would love to just like get somebody who is like Arabic uh, or speaks and can read Arabic to like that kind of extent and like esoteric Arabic uh, and then translate that stuff into English because it would be absolutely incredible to learn. Um, but the problem you have is that when you bring that kind of stuff into academia is because philosophy is kind of, it's still seen as like an accepted school in academia and we're still seeing as an accepted thing like not on the fringe uh i think it's kind of affected the academic translation of a lot of these texts because the philosophical hermetic has been translated but a lot of the technical because it's all alchemy and astrology and magic and esotericism because esotericism as a topic or as a discipline is still on the fringe of academia i think it's still affecting but there's just not as much incentive, I think, for academics to, to translate it, which is kind of a shame. It's really interesting material. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this is always the, you know, the big problem. I mean, we do have people out there like Liana Saif and, uh, at the University of Amsterdam who's working mm. on the, the rendering the Picatrix from Arabic to English. Mm. But yeah, I mean, things like the Nabataean agriculture, well, there's no modern total translation of that. And even the one that, that kind of exists is incredibly expensive. Yeah, and the technical Hermetica is just... Um, it's always finding the right person to to do it, and you have to have a very unique skill set. You need to have uh, Arabic. You have to have manuscript skills. You have mm-hmm. to have um, you need you need to really understand alchemy and astrology because they mm-hmm. you know they're technical texts. Yeah, it's just uh, I tell people, yeah, if you want to really do us a solid, go learn Arabic and do you know um, the uh, Arabia Hermetica. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's that'd be a absolutely noble thing to get translated. Um, Danitrail is working a little bit on some of the some of the Arab um, uh, Latin Hermetica texts, mm-hmm. which are philosophical, by the way. I don't know why people you know don't think of medieval Latin Hermetica as 
uh, it's philosophical. It certainly is. I mean, it's actually yeah. not hermetic, but it, it, it's uh, it's sort of qu- more quasi philosophical. But yeah, there's a great text as well. Um, there's a lot to be done. I mean, yeah. uh, this is this is what I tell people that we are in the very beginnings of um, of really the academic understanding of Western esotericism. And the more that we dig, the more we realize that it's not very Western. It's actually, you know, mm. it's, it's the, the boundary about what is Western and what is not Western has more to do with our prejudices. Mm. And it often has to do with the actual scholarship because scholarship, ancient scholarship didn't know about the West. Yeah, there, there was no, I mean, there wasn't really a West until like, yeah. you know, 15th, 16th century, whatever right. it is, right? Yeah. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a completely artificial construct. And so, um, so yeah, we're, we're learning is that the more we try to shove this into the, the whole of Western esotericism, the more we, you know, that just, it, it doesn't fit and it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so what we're realizing is, oh yeah, like is Syriac literature Western. Like what are we, this is, mm. you know, cause we know that there was a huge Syriac community of people uh, that were uh, Syriac Christians that were working on esoteric, you know, oh, esoteric texts. I mean, how many Syriac scholars out there? I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's a, it's, it's a tiny little world. Yeah. It's insane. Um, but yeah, you know, it's I I, I have hope. <laughs> I have hope that eventually, you know, I it would be I think it would be a really interesting project if we just like got a bunch of like academics who were uh, like interested in esotericism and got practitioners together and see if we pulled them together and saw what happened, um, and see if if there was any kind of overlap in. Uh, I, I was talking to one of my friends. Um, the other week actually about this, and he he is obviously a practicing occultist, uh, and he works quite often with like Egyptian deities or Egyptian concepts and that kind of thing. Uh, and one of the things that we were talking about is that in his experience, every time he's worked with Egyptian deities, uh, they've come through to him or he's experienced them in, in whatever way he does uh, in line with a lot of what the textual sources say that they are doing, how they're presented, how their personalities are like, what they look like, that kind of thing. Um, and then like, it, it's such an interesting conversation to have where it's like, do these entities if they, you know, if, if you accept their existence outside of the text, outside of mythology, as like actual individual beings, do they, when they come through, do they come through consistently in the same way as, as you know, a, a, a magician a thousand years ago who was working the PGM experienced them, right? Because when you look at the PGM, the PGM is is basically just like the hand, like the the handwritten journal working notes of an Egyptian sorcerer or a Greek sorcerer in, in antiquity, right? Like it's not like a, a textbook, it's just it's basically just a personal journal. And even then it goes back like the the whole experiment tradition really goes back to the PGM, I think, because you like you look at the PGM and then there are a couple of uh, of quite a few times actually where uh, you just have the, the the authors going, okay, this spell was tested seven times, or this was done nine times, and it worked great. It's, it's the best one in this, you know. <laughs> I, I can even remember one of them uh, where he's like, it, it's it's a it's a spell for like combating anxiety and depression, that kind of thing, uh, where you're like invoking some kind of like I think it's, I think it's like the Agathon Diamond, something about like a holy genius, basically. Um, and he does it and he goes, yeah, this spell is the best. Like if you don't do it, you have yourself to blame because you know, you have the resources to do it, which is kind of like that Egyptian sass that comes in, which is hilarious to me. Um, but I think, yeah, even if you look at grimoires as, as that, because grimoires can be both, I think, massive, like textual, um, treaties on things, but they're also magicians, personal workbooks. Mm-hmm. So also they have like a more human element to them as well, I think, but. No, right. I mean, it's you know, certainly the case that you know, the, that's why I love working with manuscripts because manuscripts mm. are really alive in a way that printed books, you know, there's marginality in printed books, but mm. once the text is printed, it's printed and that becomes sort of the standard version of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the PD, the PGM also is just a very heterogeneous body of literature. It's, mm. you know, sometimes some of it is like, you know, PGM four, the great Paris magical papyrus. That is mm. one work of an individual sorcerer. Mm. Other sections are just fragments of things. Yeah. Uh, you know, my favorite ones are actually the ones that are clearly industrial where mm. it's uh there was a you know an industry of making amulets and stuff and they were like um they leave the sections blank to put the names in and then mm. come back later and that's love the idea that they're just drawing up amulets and waiting for someone to come buy them and then you're like oh yeah stick your name in there yeah you know, whatever <laughs> uh you know it's again it's just shows you that that mad people say oh you can't buy and sell magic i'm like I mean, who says you can't yeah histor- historically speaking you absolutely <laughs> can <laughs> yeah i mean people can- people could and did um so yeah, it's, 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 that's, you know, funny in that way. Um, but yeah, the, the traditions, the manuscripts, they're alive 
in a certain kind of way. And I think that putting them back into their cultural context is is super important. As to whether the gods appear the same way they would back then, I can't imagine. Even back then, they changed. You know, the thinking of Toth is a great example. You know, the mm. you know it's funny. The still the standard study of Toth, the god, is about a hundred years old. There hasn't been a a, a significant monograph on Toth in a hundred years. Mm. Um, um, but um, what's interesting is to see how Toth changed. It, you know, the Toth did not start off as a as a uh, wisdom magic god, you know. Called. No, yeah, he was like a. I, I think he was originally a moon god, wasn't? Yeah, he? moon god. Yeah, it was a yeah. moon god, and then been very a very particular region of of, of Egypt. Mm. And so even these gods in their historical context aren't stable, and so it'd be unsurprising to me if they altered. You know, um, also it's just weird, like what gods people seem to be uh, oriented to. I know some Norse people who I don't know really mm. like Odin, and I yeah. find like Odin would be he's just a a crappy guy i don't know even the the norse literature itself doesn't like things of him as cowardly and yeah vicious and um and cunning in a way that people are like yeah i want to go to valhalla and i'm like if you want if you end up in valhalla it's because odin tricked you into a battle to get you killed on purpose yeah like, he's not your friend he's recruiting you for he, he's basically recruiting you for a doomed fight you can't win yeah um <laughs> and you're like enthusiastically about it it's like this i don't know um like yes, yeah. Wait, yeah. It's, it's the same. Yeah, I, I find the same thing with with both actually as well. Because when you look at like the the modern kind of spiritual conception of both, if you go down the whole different channelings route and the the whole Atlantis King thing, um, people will think like they leave them in with the whole sort of New Age uh, idea of like oneness and source and love and everything like that. But you go back to the PGM, and both is, is being invoked in, in like love spells. Uh, things like that and then by our standards those spells are brutal right like, like you oh, read yeah. some of the spells of pgm it's horrific some of the things they're doing and thoth is the entity through which those things are working right like they're, right. they're calling on him to do that stuff like and it's, like uh it's bringing in more customers to your business it's it's bringing a woman to you in some very unpleasant ways um i think even like in his guise as i think hermes Clothonios sometimes so like hermes of the underworld he, he he's used as an entity to raise demons and send yeah. demons against people right but no one wants to talk about that version of Poe. yeah it's not all love and light is it um yeah yeah I, yeah it's there's there's a, certainly a dark side to you know defixiones yeah. and all this stuff as well sure yeah it's uh that horrifying image of the uh, from the greek period of the woman bound up tied arms and legs the pen stuck in all the various parts yeah. of her body yeah it's a horrifying image and it shows yeah. you yeah this magic is not all love and light yeah um yeah and it's again it's a pity because this sort of misconception of toth um it, it's pity because there is actually a book of thoth like we have yeah, one, the, the like, demonic the, one yeah. the demonic book yeah we actually have one no one really knows what the hell it means um but we do have actual you know, legit egyptian literature about this being that was probably used in a ritual setting and, mm -hmm. and it's a pity because you know i I mention it to people and they're like, Oh yeah. You mean the, the book of Toth, the Atlantean? I'm like, no, not that. Yeah. Uh, that's don't interesting. Get me, but don't get me started on that. Yeah. But I'm like, yeah, we actually have a, an actual ritual text probably used by priests in their initiation programs and yeah, you know, preserved in the Egyptian language. And most people don't, you know, don't even know this. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's done even though it's not on their radar. And I think that's, you know, that's to partially be blamed on academics who are happy to be, you know, publish their book in some obscure journal and make it cost a ton of money. And yeah, um, well, like, like, like if, if, or, or any of the major, like, well, if you try and get your hands on like any proper, like really well site academic material, you're going to be like paying hundreds. No, it's in brill and like, those guys. Yeah. Like the, the access, the accessibility of, of academia is another like pet peeve of mine where it's like, I want to make it more accessible because it's, it's, it's one of those situations where, I think it's just kind of like a closed loop. It's like a catch ring two for things where when you're looking at any of any of the major spiritual systems or anything like that, it, it descends into like conspiratorial or political thinking and usually racist undertones, that kind of thing. Mostly because out of out of fear, right? Because people are are coming at this whether they think that there's some kind of us versus them mentality and they think that archaeologists and historians and academics are somehow hiding the truth from everybody. But at the same way, I think academics are also slightly to blame because the, uh, the work there is just not accessible. Like the, the, it's not accessible to the general public right. at all. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I lament this constantly on the channel, uh, just how expensive books by Brill are and other publishers. Mm. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's why I, I, I love doing Esoterica, uh, the yeah. channel. It's, it's meant precisely to cut that Gordian's knot by um, me 
presenting the information that in a completely academic way, relying on the academic texts, mm. uh, but making them accessible to anyone who, you know, who has a phone on them. So, yeah. yeah, I think it will change. But, yeah, I think that the academic market is is that, you know, you publish your obscure book um, so that 10 people can read it and five of them will hate you for it. And and then you go along your jolly way and you're in your job. Um, but the truth of the matter is people really want access to this stuff. Yeah. And it's a task of people like us to, you know, to do some of that bridge building. So I'm, yeah. you know, in terms of my work in Esoterica, that's where I really delight is being mm. like, oh yeah, there is a book of Toth in Demotic and here's what it's kind of about. And mm. um, so it's fun in that way. Cause otherwise I think people would not know about it at all. And um, I tell my fellow academics that look, if you don't want to be on YouTube, um, the the vacuum left behind by good scholarship is insanity. That's what yeah. fills the gap is insane people and, and dangerous people. And I'm yeah. like, and I was like, look, we have to fill the gap. And if YouTube is a search engine, which it very much is, mm. uh, we have a moral and scholastic obligation to fill that gap. And if my expertise is in Western esotericism, well, then that's the gap I'll try to fill. So yeah. that's been that's been basically the in many ways the mandate for the channel and what's motivated me to do it. Yeah. I, I yeah, I think it's it's beautiful. It really, it really is. And I'm yeah, I'm I'm in the same vein of it. Like I I I'm running the community I am at the moment and I'm making a conscious effort to try and digitize manuscripts and make them available uh for anyone that's in there. But yeah, it's 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 a tough thing. Because yeah, like you said, you know, I it's I completely agree. I think like the vacuum that's left is unfortunately things like the Emerald, like the 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 tablets of folk the Atlantean, right? In, in comparison. And one other thing I was I was looking at the other day. Um it's kind of it's just kind of a bit mind-boggling to me, but because you look at it and there are sections in Doriel's translation, there were Doriel's text there that are copy and pasted from HP Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. the entire way they're they're like word for word sections and in fact it, it's also kind of hilarious to me um because the little like map of the what is it, like the islands of atlantis that he draws in there like one of the islands he calls yog -Sothoth. like he says yog -Sothoth is an island of atlantis and it's like that's literally a lovecraftian elder god like i don't yeah. know like who are you trying to fool <laughs> with this um but I mean, yeah. the whole atlantis the whole i mean i mean we, well, I mean, we can start wrapping up soon I mean, this will be another, another huge uh conversation anyway another, another point but the whole atlantis story because people cite plato as the source for atlantis but again it, it's a typical example of it's more widely known than read yeah. because everybody cites plato as the source for atlantis but nobody actually looks at what plato says about atlantis for it <laughs> Right. Because everyone like you have this sort of utopian spiritual idea of what Atlantis is, that it's this super beautiful and advanced civilization. And you read Plato, and Plato doesn't quite like it. He, he doesn't paint a positive picture of Atlantis. Like oh, Atlantis for Plato is yeah. like horrific, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and also it's not the only myth. Like, why 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 that myth? Why not the other mythical cities he invents or the other mythical yeah. stories, like the myth of Ur to be found at the end of uh, the Republic? Um, yeah, Plato invents myths all the time. Um yeah. It's just that, you know, some weird Confederate veteran in the 19th century really latched on to, uh, to, to the Atlantis one. And now it's become bread and butter for all kinds of conspiracy theory things. But, yeah, you know, people think that, yeah, the academic, academics and archaeologists are hiding things or the Vatican's hiding things. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I have to tell them that, you know, I've been the Vatican archives. It's not that hard to get in. I mean, you have to have a reason to go there. Yeah. But it's not. You know, but of course you say that and then immediately, oh, they didn't let you go to the real archives. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I mean, like it's only so far beneath the Tiber. They're going to dig this thing. I don't know. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, academics are, are partially to be blamed for this. And like you said, what gets left behind in the in the aftermath of this is 15 videos on YouTube about Toth the Atlantean. And um, oh, I've had people even tell me that the demonic book of Toth is not really about it's not really real. It's oh yeah this, yeah this is this is the typical one that i always hear it's like oh well you're just misinterpreting the egyptian texts it's like yeah. okay I, my degree is in archaeology i learned how i took like two three semesters of middle egyptian late egyptian like sure you, you can tell me that i'm misreading the egyptian please right. yeah i mean i will say that yeah demotic is a nightmare just in yeah, terms of like the demoticists have all my have all my admiration that's just yeah um yeah reading something and you know 
nice cursive hieratic or whatever is okay, mm. but the yeah, demonic stuff is like it's, scribbles. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> well, yeah I, I admire those guys. Yeah. Go on. All right. Well, well, I should get going actually. It's yeah, right. That's yeah, that's let's wrap up. I think we've been on here for nearly an hour and a half, nearly two hours actually, ten minutes yeah. or two hours. So hey, good yeah. on you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for coming on, Justin. It's been brilliant. yeah, of course. Yeah, and I'm happy to come on again. And um, it's when you reach out to me. I know it was a bit of a pain, and I apologize. Um, but no uh, thank you for being yeah. patient. And um, yeah, good luck with your with the project. I think having you know rigorous. Uh, Rigorous religiosity matched with rigorous scholasticism. Mm. Um, I think both of those things benefit uh, from each other. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, good, good luck, luck good with that satirica, and I'll, I'll be tuning in uh, tomorrow for it. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'm going to be working on the next episode tomorrow on Reuchlin. So um, all right. Well, take it easy. Right. Have a great night. You too, man. All right. All right. See you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye.